Okay, so we're going to move along here. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Fareed. Uh, so she's another one of our homegrown talents. So she did her undergraduate work here at UCLA. Uh, she obtained her uh, medical degree at Western University uh, Health Sciences and uh, then received her postgraduate training here with us at UCLA. And she's going to talk about a very uh, salient topic, I think, for all of us, which is um, uh, the approach to celiac disease. So Mary. Okay, so by the end of this uh, discussion today, we should all be able to answer five basic questions about celiac disease. First, what is celiac disease and how is it defined? Who should be screened? How is celiac disease diagnosed? How do we manage celiac patients? And what can we do in cases of non-responsive disease? So the first question is, what is celiac disease? Celiac disease is defined as an immune-based reaction to dietary gluten which is the storage protein for wheat, barley, and rye in genetically predisposed individuals. Injury to the small bowel, which is characterized by inflammation and villous atrophy, occurs when the body is exposed to gluten. This results in chronic malabsorption, nutrient deficiencies, and a number of GI symptoms. The classic signs and symptoms of celiac disease include diarrhea, bulky foul-smelling stool, floating stool due to steatorrhea from fat malabsorption, flatulence, weight loss, iron deficiency anemia, and various vitamin deficiencies. However, there has been a shift over the years from patients presenting with classic celiac symptoms to those who present with atypical symptoms or even those patients who are completely asymptomatic. The atypical symptoms of celiac disease include recurrent abdominal pain, postprandial abdominal pain, bloating, abdominal distension, constipation, diarrhea, irregular bowel habits, mood changes, and poor appetite. So as you can see from this slide, many of these symptoms that can be seen in celiac disease also overlap in those patients who have irritable bowel syndrome, as well as those who have uninvestigated dyspepsia. There's been a number of studies over the years looking at the overlap between those patients who have uh, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms and celiac disease. Uh, a study in 2009 looked at the prevalence of biopsy-proven celiac disease ca in cases meeting the diagnostic criteria for IBS was more than fourfold that in, the, in control patients without IBS. Another study looked at adult patients presenting with nonspecific abdominal symptoms, and they found that celiac serology tested in this population had a high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis. So this brings us to our next question is, who should we be screening for celiac disease? Well, we know that there are a number of disorders that are well associated with celiac disease, including dermatitis herpetiformis, Down syndrome, IgA deficiency, type 1 diabetes, thyroid disease, and this includes both hyper and hypothyroidism, liver disease, and as we learned in, from Dr. Bevan's talk, the most uh, common manifestation is a mild, mild uh, elevation in the transaminases, various menstrual and reproductive issues, including infertility, early menarche, uh, late menopause, miscarriage, preterm labor, and low birth weight as well as a variety of neurologic disorders, and there is an increased risk of malignancy, in particular small bowel lymphoma. So who should be tested? In 2013, the American College of Gastroenterology put forth guidelines outlining exactly what type of patients we should be uh, screening for celiac disease. We know that anyone with signs or symptoms or laboratory evidence of malabsorption, such as chronic diarrhea or weight loss, should absolutely be tested. We also know, and as Dr. Connolly pointed out in her talk as well, those patients with IBS symptoms, such as postprandial abdominal pain, bloating, nonspecific diarrhea, should be tested, and it is cost-effective to test these patients. Anyone with iron deficiency anemia should be screened. First-degree family members of affected patients should be screened. Patients with unexplained elevated liver transaminases, those with type 1 diabetes, who have digestive symptoms, and women with infertility or other reproductive issues. It is somewhat controversial um, whether or not we really should be screening truly asymptomatic first-degree family members. However, most studies have shown that those patients who 
initially thought themselves to be asymptomatic actually improved their quality of life and reported overall improved health after they went on a gluten-free diet. So the next important question is how do we diagnose? Once we've determined that we're going to be screening patients, how do we make the diagnosis? Traditionally, anti glidin antibodies have been used for decades, but these are no longer recommended because of their poor diagnostic accuracy and a high rate of false positives. For example, many patients with IBS will have positive anti glidin antibodies. We don't really use that anymore. IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody is the preferred single, te single test for detection of celiac disease. A total IgA level should always be checked at the same time because of the association with IgA, IgA deficiency in patients with celiac. If the IgA levels are low, then IgG-based testing should be performed. And the typical panel includes IgG deaminated gliadin peptide as well as IgG TTG antibodies. Endomycelial antibodies also have a high diagnostic accuracy, but they are expensive and not widely available. What about genetic testing? Um, the most important genetic risk factor for celiac disease is the presence of HLA DQ heterodimers, DQ2 and DQ8. In patients with celiac disease, these had either one or the other is almost always present. Therefore, having a negative test almost certainly rules out celiac disease. However, these heterodimers are also present in about 30% of the general population. Therefore, it's not recommended routinely for initial diagnosis, but can be used in select situations when the diagnosis is unclear. An example of such a situation would be a patient who's already on a gluten-free diet who wants to be tested definitively for celiac disease. It's important to note that all of these serologies that I spoke about, the tissue transglutaminase and um, the ones listed here, all need to be done on a gluten-containing diet. If the patient is already on a gluten-free diet, then these tests are useless. Once you have a positive serology, the diagnosis must be confirmed by small intestinal biopsy, and this remains the gold standard for diagnosing celiac disease. Patients with a positive serology, as well as those patients with a high probability of celiac disease, regardless of the serology, should undergo an upper endoscopy with small bowel biopsy. At least one to two biopsies from the duodenal bulb and at least four from the second and third portion of the duodenum should be taken. So this is an example of the classic endoscopic appearance of celiac disease. There are three uh, hallmarks. Um, so the one example, this is an example of scalloping, as you can see these, um, these, the notching appearance of the folds. Second thing that we see is a mosaic pat nodular or mosaic pattern, and then we see a general flattening or loss of the, of the duodenal folds. This is the classic endoscopic appearance. On histology, the classic appearance here on the top we have uh, normal, and this is advanced celiac disease. And the classic finding is flattening of the villi, um, complete atrophy, as well as an increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes. However, it's important to remember that there are other causes of villus atrophy and increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, in particular Crohn's disease, bacterial overgrowth, even H. pylori infection, or even those patients who are on chronic NSAIDs. So it is very critical to couple the histologic findings with the serologic findings because you cannot make the diagnosis based on histology alone. It's also important to remember that we often receive pathology reports um, indicating a mild increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes. So this by itself is not enough to make a diagnosis of celiac disease as that can be seen as I mentioned in patients with H. pylori or who were taking Motrin at the time or various other conditions. So what happens when the serology and the histology don't agree? For example, you have a positive serology, but then the biopsy is negative. Well, this can be due to a few reasons. One is that it can be due to a sampling error, secondary to the patchy nature of celiac disease. Second, in rare situations, the you can have a false positive serology. The most common situation is a condition called latent celiac disease, which is defined as positive serology but normal histology. 
We don't fully understand the implications of latent celiac disease as we don't know how many of these patients will go on to develop full-blown celiac, and therefore we can't make any recommendations as to whether or not these patients should adapt a gluten-free diet. Over the years, there's been a growing interest in an entity called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and I think we all have um, have experienced patients coming into our office uh, convinced that they have celiac disease and they've already gone on a gluten-free diet, um, or patients that are, um, are fairly certain that they have celiac because they've Googled it on the internet and the symptoms are exactly what they have. This is defined as patients with celiac-like symptoms upon exposure to dietary gluten but who do not meet the diagnostic criteria for celiac disease. This is not associated with malabsorption or complications, and there is no increased risk for malignancy. This is one of those situations where genetic testing might be useful, as those patients are often already on a gluten-free diet by the, by the time they come to me, and, um, and when they re require testing, this is one thing that can be helpful. Again, this topic is somewhat controversial. Um, again, we don't entirely understand uh, if gluten is truly the trigger for their symptoms and whether um, and what proportion of these patients may go on to develop celiac disease later on. So how is celiac disease treated? The, the cornerstone of treatment of celiac disease is, of course, elimination of gluten from the diet. The principal sources of dietary gluten are wheat, barley, and rye. These patients often develop a secondary lactose intolerance, so when treatment is begun, it's often helpful to um, have them avoid dairy at the beginning. The benefits of a gluten-free diet have been well documented in several studies. Um, these include symptomatic improvements, such as resolution of bloating, abdominal pain, and diarrhea partial or complete reversal of micronutrient deficiency, including uh, clinical sequelae such as bone loss due to vitamin D deficiency. There are a small number of studies showing possibly a decreased risk of malignancy, in particular small bowel lymphoma, as well as a reduction of various uh, uh, female uh, complications, including preterm labor, infertility, spontaneous abortion, and low birth weight. Improvement of liver enzymes is seen on a gluten-free diet, as well as a de decreased risk of developing other autoimmune disorders associated with celiac disease. The key elements in celiac disease management can be remembered by this simple mnemonic. The most important is consultation with a skilled dietitian. Oftentimes, we in the office don't have the time or the expertise to go over the details of a gluten-free diet with the patient, and this really should be uh, done by a skilled dietitian. Our patients should be educated about their disease, and they should be encouraged to adhere to a lifelong gluten-free diet. Identification and treatment of neutral defi nutri nutritional deficiencies is important, and they should have access to an advocacy group, just uh, like the Celiac Disease Foundation, and continuous long-term follow-up is important with periodic checking of uh, vitamin levels as well as serologies and making sure they are up-to-date on their vaccines and DEXA scan. So what if a gluten-free diet is not working? You have a patient who um, has diarrhea, for example. They have been on a gluten-free diet, and they continue to have symptoms. This is defined as persistent symptoms, signs, or laboratory abnormalities typical of celiac disease despite 6 to 12 months of a gluten-free diet. And it's important to remember that it may take that long to see a significant improvement in symptoms, and patients should be educated about that. This can be seen in up to 30% of patients. There are a number of causes of non-responsive celiac disease, but the most, by far the most common is inadvertent gluten ingestion. And this takes us back to the importance of consultation with a skilled dietitian because patients may be taking in gluten without realizing it. Other associated conditions that can cause chronic diarrhea in those who have celiac disease despite a gluten-free diet include microscopic colitis, bacterial overgrowth, of course, celiac patients can also have irritable bowel syndrome. And if there are other alarming features, you should always consider the development of small bowel lymphoma. The evaluation of patients in non-responsive celiac disease always begins by reviewing the initial diagnosis and reviewing the initial serology and histology. Again, a review of their diet by a skilled dietitian to make sure they're not inadvertently taking in gluten. 
checking celiac serologies is a good uh, uh, first step because if the serologies are positive, then that indicates ongoing gluten exposure. If there is a question regarding the diagnosis, a repeat small intestinal biopsy would be helpful. If the serologies are negative, then I would consider a colonoscopy to rule out microscopic colitis, as this is well associated with celiac, and of course a small bowel evaluation if lymphoma is suspected. So the take-home points are we should screen for celiac disease in any patient with GI symptoms, iron deficiency anemia, type 1 diabetes, elevated transaminases, and in those first-degree family members of celiac patients. IgA anti-TGG antibody is the preferred single test. Small bowel biopsy is absolutely necessary for confirmation. And don't forget that all diagnostic testing should be done while the patient is on a gluten-containing diet. A gluten-free diet is the cornerstone of therapy and requires consultation with a skilled dietitian. And we should always reevaluate the diagnosis in those patients who are not responding. <laughs>